This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Thank you so much, Julie, and uh, welcome everybody to this lecture series. I've had the pleasure of being here um, watching some of these series, and I'm hoping I can uh, live up to my predecessors on giving a great talk tonight. And for tonight, really, what I want to talk about is um, sort of overall what we do in space medicine. Most people don't know about what space medicine is. Actually, many people are not sure really what NASA does anymore. <laughs> and so what I want to do is not really dive into some particular you know, genetic process or radiation type of shielding that we're looking at to use, but rather give you a sort of overall swath of what it is that um, is happening in aerospace medicine and in extreme environments. So I'll jump around for some different topics. Um, I do ask to please hold your questions till the end of the lecture, but if there's any term or any jargon that I sort of fall back into, please feel free to just put up your hand and I can clarify right away. Um, first, of course, with uh, any lecture, I do have to give you a disclaimer. Um, none of the contents in this talk is uh, sponsored by commercial interest. None of the treatments I will talk about are FDA approved, and it's definitely a don't try this at home um, situation. <laughs> and, um, I am not representing officially IHMC, NASA, or Red Bull, or Google, uh, <laughs> which, and you'll understand a little bit, uh, in a little bit why. Um, so first of all, you know, even from my colleagues in the emergency room, people ask me, oh, NASA's still there? I thought we shut that down. Um, <laughs> after the shuttle retired, unfortunately, many people thought, oh, you know, NASA's gone, that's it. Um, hopefully, after this uh, talk, you'll realize that we're far from there. We also don't know everything we've been doing. Although, uh, you know, we've been flying in space for over 50 years, uh, there's definitely a lot of unknowns. And I think what we've learned over the last decade or two is that what we don't know is more and more. Uh, we're just knowing what we don't know as opposed to just not being aware about it. Um, we also haven't done it all before. And even when we're talking about returning to the moon, uh, what we're planning to do in the, in the future as a nation, as, as NASA, is very different from what happened back in Apollo. And then I'll talk a little bit about what's coming up new um, so that um, we realize that you know, NASA is not shut down. So first I wanted to give, spend the, the first uh, five, 10 minutes to give you a quick update. So this is not space medicine, but it's just to get everybody aware of uh, things that are happening. So first of all, um, Artemis. Are people here familiar with the Artemis program? By a show of hands. No, okay, so that's one thing that's uh, definitely you know, going gangbusters, especially over in Houston for NASA. And this is a call by the president to basically get the, uh, another, the next American man and the first woman on the lunar south pole by 2024. So we're talking about four years away. We're going to have two Americans hopefully walk on the, uh, at the south pole of the moon. Um, I'll talk a little bit about commercial cargo and crew. Many people may have heard more of SpaceX and, and Boeing. Those have been more in the news. And then also a little bit of space tourism and where that's been and where that's heading. <coughs> um, so Artemis is this uh, uh, directive, Space Directive 1 by uh, President Trump that said, you know, we want the next American man and first uh, American woman. It is going to be using the NASA Orion capsule, uh, which has been in development for over the last uh, 10, 15 years, it's really basically the, the replacement for the space shuttle. Think of it like Apollo, but uh, about 30% bigger, same shape overall. But it does require a human lander system. So if you, for those of you that remember the, the lunar lander or the LAM, that sort of spidery looking thing, we're gonna need another one of those. That's up for contracting and that's actually bids for that should be, uh, have already been received and we should be hearing a, an official announcement the next month or so of what that's <laughs> actually gonna look like. It's gonna be a lot bigger than that um, spider looking thing, than that lunar lander. Um, and that has a whole host of challenges that we don't have the time to get into today, but it's gonna be very interesting as well. We also have a next generation spacesuit uh, that's being developed that's not only gonna replace that white uh, moon suit that you've seen from Apollo and shuttle and ISS, but it's gonna be uh, much better, uh, much more capable. Uh, not gonna have any of these issues about you know, getting the right size for women, like many of you probably heard about in the news where they had to cancel an EVA for that. Um, and then there's also gonna be a lot of commercial lunar payloads. So between now and 2024, there's gonna be a lot of landers going on the moon, robot landers that are gonna be doing some initial um, research work in terms of what the environment looks like. And it's all really about these um, PSRs, permanently shattered regions. So on the south pole of the moon, if you think about it, right, the sun, is over close to the horizon. And so if you have a little crater, you can imagine that the bottom of that crater never sees the sun. 
And so that allows water crystals and other um, volatiles to actually accumulate. And so that could be a resource for a future lunar base. And so that's the great scientific interest. What it will look like, we really don't know. They have all of these designs of uh, you know, what it could look like. But basically, we're thinking about you know, a big lander on top of a big stack with a big crater right next to it, where you can go in there and get the stuff that's you know, still there because it's so cold. Um, on the commercial crew side, um, I assume people mostly have heard about SpaceX. Um, they are the, you know, Elon Musk, who's a, a very public figure, has launched this sort of challenge to get to Mars, but has actually been working in close collaboration with NASA to get uh, Americans back from, uh, back from the US and launching from Florida back to space. Uh, back in 2015, they had this uh, pad abort test. And I'll show some videos here. I was asked specifically to have lots of pictures and videos. So Two. if you bear One. with me, you'll see what a pad abort test looks like. The idea here is if you have a problem before you launch, you can get the crew um, safely off the launch pad. Right and so you have to demonstrate that this capsule is safe Slightly to use. Nominal. So uh, we've seen some of these pedal boards. Um, SpaceX did this successfully, again, here off the uh, Cape Canaveral um, a few years ago. And this shows you a little bit of what an abort looks like. Um, you can imagine that the forces that the crew are subject to are, are pretty significant. And so we need to make sure that from a medical perspective, we're understanding what the risks are, what the exposures are, and how we manage it. So it's not just floating around in space, but pulling several G forces. So basically, getting into a car crash on takeoff, and then sort of another gentle car crash, if you can have such a thing, you know, back on splashdown in the water. So SpaceX has been doing this, but um, and then they've also gone to the space station itself. So they've sent and that's a picture, not a you know a, a diagram or a, or a computer simulation on the bottom left of this capsule making it to the space station and then coming back in the water. And again, it's going to be a little bit like uh, back of the you know, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo days where we're going to have in-water recoveries. And so you'll see a lot more activity in the Gulf as well as on the Atlantic side of Florida for um, crew recovery. Boeing is the other contractor that's been funded to do this. They did a pilot board test just in November of last year uh, where they did launch successfully. They did have only two of the three parachutes that actually um, deployed. Uh, but again, that was something that is uh, what you get out of testing, and that's what we test uh, you know, before we launch. So you can see, again, a, a very similar uh, type of approach where you're subjecting the crew to several Gs, basically. Uh, um, think of it like being launched off an aircraft carrier, but a lot harder. Um, and again, you're trying to come back and clear the launch pad for a possible um, explosion. And you see how these big parachutes come out and allow for a, hopefully a nice gentle landing. Once you get to, um, you know, you get off the pad, you can start practicing, you know, getting to the space station. And again, just for the recency, this was back in December, basically a month ago, uh, they had a test flight to the ISS. They actually failed to reach in this particular test flight to reach the space station because of a, actually a clock mismatch. So the capsule was a little bit confused as to where it should be in, the, in terms of the flight regime. But it did successfully launch, and they decided not to try to get it near the space station. It is a $100 billion you know, lab up there, so you want to be careful when, when you show up. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know that, that park assist needs to be working really well. You don't want to back into it. And uh, just actually, just in January 19th, um, SpaceX went through another of their uh, milestones, and they've had uh, an in-flight abort. So here it's the scenario here. It's imagine you're launching, you're off the, the rocket, and the rocket decides to explode on the way up. Many of you remember Challenger. Um, Challenger did not have uh, a, a board system during launch. They came up with some alternatives or some workarounds for uh, shuttle flights after Challenger, but they were still not, um, not likely to be uh, highly survivable. So in this system, they figured out, you know, if we have this capsule that can blast off, you know, with its own power from a launch pad, we could also use that to blast off of the rocket. And so it's designed, both capsules, Boeing and, and SpaceX, are designed to be able to do it. So when you see here, they separate the capsule. Uh, the rocket doesn't like that. And uh, so you get a big fireball. But the capsule is safe and sound. And it actually sort of just keeps going all the way up, almost to space, and then it comes back down 
um, safely in the water. So you see it again. This is like from the capsule itself. You'll see how it drops the lower half of the trunk. And then once it comes down, it releases its parachutes. And there they are. Drogue chutes are out. Very shortly. And once you get those pilot chutes, once it gets slow enough, it opens the big parachutes. And again, a lot of lessons learned on why you want to open your parachutes at different altitudes. We'll talk at the very end of this lecture about Soyuz 11, which unfortunately had you know, uh, an issue with valves opening too high up, and, and it ended up uh, causing a lethality for the, the crew, crew members, ended up dying. So. Every step here needs to be carefully controlled to make sure that we're protecting uh, the crew as, as much as possible. Um, and I'll skip the, the splashdown. Um, but there's also more coming. So I do want you all to you know, hopefully stay tuned now. Um, just in April, we should have actually SpaceX fly the first crew to the space station as a test flight. Um, we'll see that by Boeing hopefully in the June time frame. In July, SpaceX will be f actually exchanging the first crew. So again, we used to use a space shuttle launching from Florida for since the shuttle retired. We've been solely depending on Soyuz and the Russians to get our crew um, up and down from the space station. Um, now this is the first time we'll have Americans launch from the US and actually do ISS crew rotations in that way. Boeing will hopefully follow shortly uh, in December. There's also space tourism. And this is one that also makes the news, uh, much more so than you know, the space station. The ones that you hear about most are uh, Virgin Galactic, and that's with Sir Richard Branson, the uh, British entrepreneur who's uh, made his name in a variety of you know, record industry, airlines, uh, drinks. And uh, Blue Origin, uh, which is run by Jeff Bezos, who's the CEO of Amazon. Um, so he's the one that decided he's got so much money, he figured, where could I you know, spend? You know, a good fortune. And so he decided he's selling basically $1 billion of Amazon stock every year to fund Blue Origin, which is his um, space program. So that's a program privately you know, funded to the tune of $1 billion a year. Um, NASA actually announced that there's open for ISS visits. So if you can't afford a ticket to the space station, you can actually pay. Uh, I think the last number I heard was about $35,000 a night. So it's a little bit of an expensive suite. but. <laughs> If you have that kind of cash you know, laying around, you can uh, book a couple nights on the space station if you'd like. Um, and then I'll talk also about some other sort of extreme environments. And I'll talk a little bit about high altitude jumps as a mechanism to illustrate uh, some of the challenges in space medicine. And I had the opportunity to work on a couple of those. So I have some uh, interesting videos from them. So space medicine really uh, spans the gamut of human experience and, and human factors. It's basically every organ system is involved. There's no such thing as a, you know, a hematologist or a gastroenterologist. When you're talking about space, you need all of them. You need everybody there. Um, and so we're talking about radiation, the risks of isolation, the human-machine interaction and cooperation, uh, which can actually sometimes be as, as dangerous as um, the actual uh, environment itself. And so we don't have time to go through all of these, so I picked a couple uh, that I uh, uh, wanted to bring in and are a little bit more um, I think uh, interesting to, to delve into. So the first thing I'll, I'll talk about is ebulism. So ebulism is what happens when you're exposed to a vacuum. So as you go higher and higher and higher in altitude, you can think that you know as the pressure drops, same thing as a scuba diver going up, uh, coming up too quickly, you can get decompression sickness. If you keep going high, um, really high, when you think about the top of Everest, then you don't have enough oxygen, and so you get hypoxic. So you can feed that with oxygen masks. But if you keep going high enough, the pressure is actually so low that the water inside your tissues actually starts to boil. Now, in media, it's really horribly re depicted. I didn't want to grab any of the clips from you know, Ad Ass or anything like that. People don't just explode, which is what the media shows. Um, but you do have about maybe two to three minutes of survival time before you can actually do something about it. Why I bring this up is that we actually um, worked on a project with um, John Clark, who's uh, another HMC researcher as well, uh, on some <coughs> high altitude projects. Um, I mean, we can talk about you know, the interesting profile of the, the atmospheric profile and how temperature and pressure changes over altitude. That's not really that interesting. Uh, we can do some more interesting you know, photos when you see uh, what happens when you're in a vacuum. So halfway up to where we were doing these um, altitude, high altitude jumps, I'll talk about you're already seeing the water boil, and we're going twice as high. Um, so I'll 
I'll first introduce these uh, concepts by a little summary video. Uh, so bear with me while we watch what these jumps um, were about. Now this was the Stratex high altitude jump. It was actually um, funded by Alan Eustace, who at the time was one of the Google vice presidents, and so hence the disclaimer from Google. Um, he decided that um, he wanted to explore the stratosphere almost like a scuba diver explores underwater. And so he basically, on the back of an envelope, designed this rig and then got an engineering team uh, to put it together. Realized that there would be some medical issues, and so we worked on the, on the medical team as, um, as advisors and support during these, uh, these flights. So if you, when you see this, you realize that it's basically above the atmosphere. The pressure there is less than 0.1% uh, of what we have at sea level. And so you're exposed to this risk of ebulism. Again, starting at about 60,000 feet is when you start running that risk. He, was, he did a jump from 135,000 feet, successfully landed. That's actually a, one of the great landings there. The, the start. <laughs> Spacesuits are not very flexible. So when you look on the media and you see them just you know, opening the hatch and going for a jog, that, that's not how it happens. Um, unfortunately, we'd be you know, spending our all night watching video clips and, seeing, and, and you know, explaining how they work. But this exposure to vacuum, it's not just something that you see in the, in the media and science fiction. Um, there's actually, unfortunately, in the 1940s, they were looking for high-altitude flights where they were actually testing uh, concentration camp victims where they put them in an altitude chamber until they died, basically, and understand what was happening. But even in, in, the, um, in space flight, we had some uh, injuries or some fatalities. The Russians lost in one of the Volga flights in 1962, one of the crew. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about these lessons learned at the end, but basically a visor cracked, the suit depressurized, and, uh, and uh, he died uh, during, the, uh, during the jump. In 1969, actually in the middle of the Apollo program, um, I'll show a little video, but we actually had um, a technician that was exposed to 120,000 feet for about 30 seconds or so. So he actually had a very um, short exposure. But we've seen it even in F-104s, which are basically um, jet fighters where they would actually put a little rocket pack and get them to go a little bit higher so they could sort of lob themselves in high altitude um, for interesting you know, military purposes. But uh, you know, a glove that wasn't properly um, coupled popped during that altitude and that led to loss of pressure and the pilot unfortunately died. Soyuz 1 was uh, another, and so that's actually Soyuz 11. Soyuz 1 was another fatality, Soyuz 11 was one with the three crew members. As they were coming back after a successful uh, long stay in orbit, the uh, equalization valve that lets the cabin equalize with the exterior actually opened up too high, and so they lost all their atmosphere um, before basically entering the Earth. And so they all three, unfortunately, uh, passed away. And so that's why they now wear those um, spacesuits that you see. The Russians wear those little, they look kind of like little hunched back suits, it was because they realized in a shirt sleeve environment you have no protection, no backup. In 1982, there's actually an industrial chamber where um, one worker was actually exposed uh, for about three minutes, we think, to 90,000 feet, and it took about a year to recover. The Challenger breakup, which I actually mentioned early, um, earlier, when we see the video, we see sort of like that big fireball. Actually, what happened there was one of the SRBs, the solid rocket boosters on the side, failed, and so the space shuttle itself didn't explode. It just merely twisted a little bit, and as soon as it did that, the air pressure, instead of pushing on the nose, pushed on the side. That caused the orbiter, so the space shuttle part, the plane part, to break up. The cabin actually was intact, and it tumbled from 40,000 feet, which is where the breakup happened, all the way up to about 63,000 feet. So again, we get to this critical altitude. Again, the crew of seven, um, because of the no uh, pressure suits, they basically were hypoxic and passed out. So they were unconscious uh, for that. But what actually, the unsurvivable part, other than the exposure to, uh, you know, that you couldn't protect with the space, it was actually just the impact with the water. So the whole ballistic trajectory and return was actually survivable. And so that's one thing where we realized that there's a little bit room for improvement. As a result of that is when they switched to wearing those pumpkin suits, those orange suits that are so uh, familiar with, uh, with shuttle flights. And that would actually, you know, have protected uh, them for that. The tube pressurized this is what it looks like when somebody actually does get exposed to vacuum. There's the, this is the one video that exists, and this is that 1967 Apollo test 
Um, this is actually in Houston at JSC in an altitude chamber. Jim LeBlanc is wearing a prototype of the Apollo lunar suit. I'll you know, speak over the voiceover, but what happens is that his oxygen tube gets disconnected. And so his suit basically vents into the chamber, which is at vacuum, about 120,000 feet. And so he just instantly basically loses consciousness. Kind of the last thing I remember. And uh, what he's saying is that the last thing he remembers is basically feeling the saliva on his tongue basically bubble up and start to boil. So that's the last thing he remembers. Fortunately, they repressurized the chamber extremely quickly, and so they were able to um, save him. But if they haven't, um, this is what it looks like. This is an animal model of what happens when you expose, um, in this case, a guinea pig to a vacuum. And you see that the lung tissue on the left is what it normally looks like. And so those big pockets, you see those are the alveoli. That's where we take oxygen in and release CO2 out. When those very fine and fragile membranes get exposed to a vacuum and they're wet and they boil, they get ruptured. And so you get what you see on the right, which is ruptured uh, tissue and alveoli. So everything fills with fluids, with blood. And so it gets very difficult to manage. So when we were supporting these high altitude jumps, we actually came up with a new protocol and I don't want you to you know, try to follow this or read this. It's published out there for those who, who want you know, a little bit of help going to sleep at night. Uh, <laughs> but basically, the idea is how can we actually manage this? Um, so far, it's always been considered just to be fatal, universally fatal. And in science fiction, we see these people you know, just explode. So we just figured, don't worry about it. But no, there's actually a little bit of room for, um, for management. And when we're talking about these high altitude jumps, so we talked about Google. The Google one, I'll talk to you about a Red Bull one in a, in a couple of minutes. <coughs> we realize that if they're jumping down, they're coming down, they're only spending a few minutes in that very dangerous environment. And once they land, we have those lungs like we said, so what do we do about it? And so we realize that there's actually some room for improvement. And uh, again, this is research in space medicine that's still to be done and, and still pending. Another thing that we see is also when you're coming through the atmosphere fast is that people tend to spin. And so I'll show you some interesting videos about that. Uh, we call that a negative GZ, so the blood, if you think about it, if you spin on your belly, the blood will go to your feet and to your head. We call that a negative GZ. Um, do any of you remember the Red Bull Stratos jump from back in the day? Okay, so maybe this is a, a little bit of a recap. But basically, not quite the same as the Google jump, a little bit different. This actually took place two years before. This was uh, in October 2012. We have Felix Baumgartner, who is an Austrian uh, basically stunt uh, skydiver, get in this little capsule um, and get up to 128,000 feet before he jumped. So this is just to quickly re remind you of the, of the event. And actually that front of the screen there, that was John Clark. He's the, well, the IHMC researcher that's, uh, that worked on that jump as well. So you see in this case that you're above the atmosphere. You see the horizon. All the atmosphere is basically below you. Um, but what I want you to pay attention to is what happens when he jumps. And this is what they showed on the media. So this is what you'll see on the BBC or the Nat Geo documentary. I'll show you a little bit later what it really looked like. Um, and you see, it, when he jumps off, you, you'll see that he's very, very careful to actually step off um, and go very, very smooth step off. So you see he drops from 120,000 feet and he looks like he's dropping, you know, straight down. So comes down, falls for about four minutes, uh, breaks the speed of sound, Mach 1.27 actually on the way down. See we had some tracking cameras and we show, you know, they cut, they see there, you see there's a, maybe a little bit of a spin, right? So I want you to hold on to that a little time. And then we cut back to this and we see that he's not really spinning that much, we think, right? So hold on to that for just a second, because in the 1950s, the Air Force was actually interested in this problem when they started flying these high altitude bombers to be able to sort of loiter at high altitude and do high altitude bombing runs over to the Soviet Union. And of course, many of you may have heard of, of Gary Powers, right, who was flying in a U-2 at 80,000 feet. We thought he couldn't get shot down because the Russian missiles couldn't get there. And unfortunately, he, you know, they proved the, the Air Force wrong in that case. So in the 50s, they did these uh, dummy drops. Actually, a lot of these were over in, um, in Roswell, New Mexico. And so if you imagine when you get some little gray dummies that 
have this weird contraption and equipment on them with these large, large balloons that come down, what people might think. Um, so what was interesting about these dummies is that they tend to spin. So as they come down, they tend to spin real fast. So 170 RPM. Now these are graphs. Graphs don't really you know, talk to you like, about much. So what is you know, 170 uh, <coughs> RPM look like? And we'll, we'll see a little bit here and what happens. And let me make sure. I want to make sure this video is a little bit big, so it takes a little bit to load. This is a dummy. This is not a human. Um, but it had the whole f system that we thought would work with a human. So as you see, as you drop it down you know, from a balloon, and again, very high altitude, it tends to sort of like wobble, um, just wallow down, almost like potato chipping. So as it comes down, and then it starts basically interacting with the atmosphere, and it starts coming in contact with the atmosphere. And this is when trouble uh, begins. And this tends to happen when you're below 100,000 feet, so around 90, 80,000 feet, the atmosphere gets thick enough where it can actually do something. Before that, it's so rare that you can actually fall whichever way you want. Nothing really is going to happen. Those light flashes, and if you can see there from the frame rate, that's the sun going by. And so you see on the top one, you know, you see sort of like the flashing. So that's definitely something that you don't want to experience. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so realize, and this keeps going and going and going. This basically runs for about two and a half minutes of this. So again, if we look at the data from this dummy, we're seeing over 16 Gs, and that's with a spin protecting system. So realize that that's probably not good. And actually, as you go higher, <laughs> The higher you go, the more you spin, and so you could potentially have over 90 Gs. So a hard crash is you know, like 15 Gs, like an ejection from an airplane is about 15 Gs. Uh, so 15 times your, your body weight, basically, weighs down. So at 90, we know that's not good. Nine uh, zero. Yeah, nine zero. <laughs> this is basically an Indy car hitting a wall at full speed, um, sort of forces, for about two minutes. Um, <laughs> So realize, you know, when we're doing this, and I'm going to get too much into the details, but we realized that the axis of spin was really important. So we came up with some really interesting ways of changing the axis of rotation and basically destabilizing the system so it couldn't get into a spin. The Air Force actually had looked at this too back in the day. They actually put, you know, Air Force recruits on a little chair that you see on the side. It's basically like a big motorized Lazy Susan. And so they put, you know, blood pressure me measurements and all these sort of things, and they basically <coughs> spun them. They didn't want to hurt them, so they spun them until their eyes bled. And they figured that's probably a good you know, spot, stop, stopping point. And this is where they actually realized that if you spin through the heart, you know, it's not so good. But if you move that axis of rotation higher up, so instead of, the body tends to spin around the belly. That's where the center of gravity of a human is. It's basically right around the belly button. And they figured that instead of spinning there until you have this large moment to the feet and the, and the head, if you move it closer to the heart or as hard as you can, then it's a smaller lever arm, so you can actually tolerate much higher spin. So they realized that by you know, spinning these Air Force cadets at different uh, axes and for different times, and they realized you know, their outcome was ocular hemorrhage or no ocular hemorrhage. So, um, so I wanted to show you actually what that Red Bull jump really looked like, uh, because they, they nicely cut away from that remote, you know, to that remote camera. But this is a problem that we were seeing even in, in like low altitude flights, and we were seeing even more and more the higher we went. So if you see, you know, the step off was very smooth. He actually practiced by bungee jumping um, off a crane over and over and over again, so he could get that step off just right, so that he wouldn't have any impart any rotation or any movement. See, so he does it really, really well, you know, with all that practice. But the problem is once you start hitting the atmosphere, and you'll see on the left that ticker tape. The number all the way on the left at 0 0.7, 0 0.8, that's Mach. So Mach 1 is the speed of sound. He'll get to 1.27 times the speed of sound. And you see that one dress next to the 110,000, 109, 108, 107, hard to keep up with. That's your altitude. So that's a thing you don't want to see happening if you're in an airplane with the altimeter just dropping. <laughs> 
But you see that once you get under this, you know, 100,000 or about 90,000 feet and you start interfacing with the atmosphere, he actually gets knocked over on his back. And this is Felix Baumgartner during his last jump. And you see that you actually end up in a spin as well, just like that dummy. And you'll see that he's trying to tuck his arms in, try one arm, that doesn't work, try the arm, other arm, that doesn't work. Eventually, when you get out to about 60,000 feet, then the air is thick enough where you can actually start getting some sort of control inputs with the arms and control yourself. So he actually manages finally to stabilize himself. But we realize that the higher you go, the worse it gets, and you need some sort of stabilization system. In that one, we actually saw about 70 RPM. The dummy you saw was 170, so this, we got it down to about 70 RPM, but that was still something that we don't really want to see. And so as a result, um, the engineering team uh, came up with a spin stabilization system. So when you're spinning fast enough, it actually fires a drogue. There you saw it, it just triggers it. We'll see what that looks like you know, from the perspective of a skydiver. So this is what you'd be seeing, which again, it's a little bit disorienting, and so just trying to know which way you're trying to go <laughs> makes it hard. For the Google system, we actually had this Sabre system, which is basically a drogue shoot, like what you'd see on, um, on bombs, or actually on the, we even saw on the capsules when they have, first have a small parachute. Again, this is something, because if you actually try to open a parachute that high up, it'll just get shredded by the force, because you're going so fast. Um, other things that we see are issues with you know, human factors um, or human systems integration. And this is really what IHMC is really focused on with their uh, you know, Institute for Human Machine Cognition. And it's really it's a partnership between how humans and machines work. And sometimes they do, sometimes they work less well. So this is what happens when you design you know, a new parachute system with all these stabilization systems. You change things up. And then when you go to pull the cord to open the parachute, you could also release your parachute. Now, if any of you are skydivers, you know, throwing away a perfectly good parachute is something you don't want to do. Um, so that's called cutting away a parachute. Normally, you can do that with your regular parachute in case you have a foul or a problem, and then your reserve will deploy, and you're in your reserve. He managed to get his reserve out, but his reserve was actually also available to cut away. So you have four handles, and you want to make sure you're pulling the right one. And that was a good lesson learned as to, you know, how to design the system. Another issue we see is even in training flights, when you're at 28,000 feet, that's still high enough. You're talking about the height of Everest, so you can't just stay up there. So if you look at the guy on the right, the safety jumper there, he's waiting, and then we have an issue with the parachute, so he's waiting, 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 and he actually gets hypoxic and just basically passes out and falls out of the airplane. Now, some parachutes have automatic uh, deployment systems. This one actually didn't, so he basically woke up in free fall and realized, well, it looks like the ground's coming up. Let's <laughs> get stabilized and open a parachute before we, we hit. But again, this is, again, human systems integration. Another one I didn't personally work with you know, on this one, but is, you know, just to bring it up to, to current day, there's a Boeing 737 MAX. I think I've, everybody's heard about you know, something going on with it. Um, and I just wanted to explain real quick what happened with the system is that the 737 has been flying for decades and it's been upgraded many times. With the MAX upgrade, they basically put these much larger, much more efficient, but much more powerful engines. And you see the, the comparison between what you'd see right now on, a, you know, on the runway right now on a Southwest flight and what the 737 MAX has. So you see those engines are a lot bigger, a lot more powerful, and they're actually a lot lower. And so when you have an airplane and you have a very low, powerful engine, it's even more powerful pushing at full blast, like when you're taking off, which is what happened in the Lion Air and the Egyptian Air flights, is that when you push really hard, the airplane tries to pick its nose up, right? It's pushing the nose up. And when you're taking off, you don't want to pick your nose up too much, because then you come back down. And so Boeing designed this MCAS system, which is basically, it counters that, so it just pushes the nose down when it feels like you're getting maybe a little bit too pitched up, because you're not used to this new airplane, this new uh, big engines. The problem is when the airplane thinks it's doing that and it's not, and it pushes the nose down, it ends up crashing into the ground. And so that's what happened with Lion Air and with the Ethiopian Air. It's, again, on takeoff, you're really pulling the nose up. The airplane thinks you're pulling it too much, and so it'll just drive the nose down, unfortunately, all the way to the ground. And so that, you know, it's really not a primary system. It's a backup system. So it's sort of basically supposed to keep you out of trouble. And when that doesn't work just right, it gets you into trouble. And this was to the cost of 346 lives.
Um, there was actually some near misses in Australia before this even happened. Um, and it's to the tune as of last week, I think it's $19 billion um, that Boeing is in the hole because of these two crashes. <coughs> and it's not just saying, you know, that Boeing is, you know, the only one subject to this. Uh, for those of you who remember from a few years ago, Air France Flight 447 was going from Sao Paulo to Paris. And in that case, they also had an issue where one pilot was pulling the nose up, the other one was trying to get the nose down. The airplane said, well, I'll just average it and not move it. And so the airplane just crashed all the way down into the ground because, again, human systems integration, how do we get uh, the airplane or a complex machine to do something that we're trying to do? Asiana flight, the crash in, in um, San Francisco was also another one where it was misconfigured airplane on the, on the approach path. So, you know, what we hear from doctors are they just, you know, they're saying, oh, well, you know, the nanny says, like, you, you really can't do this, this is not safe. And, you know, we're not, you know, the safest thing is not to go to space, not to get on an airplane, but of course that's not what we do. And so we always want to push the limits, but we always have to learn from our mistakes. And so I just wanted to go through some of these lessons learned that we had. I talked briefly earlier about this 1962 Volga crash. So there's two people, um, in that capsule, and they were doing high altitude testing, kind of like what the Air Force was doing, you know, over Roswell. When the second person jumped, uh, tried to step out, the face plate just hit that upper rim, the hatch, and that just cracked the visor and led to the depressurization of the suit. So, um, unfortunately, that um, led to the death of, of Peter Ilyovich, who was uh, <laughs> the crew member there. In the 1960s, um, Nick Piantanita was doing the strato jump um, program. As he was ascending, actually, at 57,000 feet, his visor opened, or he accidentally opened it. Um, he basically lost all the atmosphere. The crew on the ground heard that something was going wrong. They released the parachutes, and the capsule came down. So they released the balloon, and the, the capsule came down on parachutes. Unfortunately, because the parachutes were open from the beginning, it basically took a long, long time to come down. And during all that time, he was getting no oxygen. And so when he landed, he was alive, but basically brain dead. And after a four-month coma, they decided to withdraw life support. So that's why when you see those pilot chutes opening, and then the main chutes opening later, like I was saying earlier, that's why we want to do that. We don't want to stay in those high altitudes. So we want to come down as fast as possible, as small as parachutes as we can use to stabilize things. And then when we're getting low enough, that's when we want to open the big parachutes. Um, in 1960, uh, Joe Kittinger actually was doing um, Excelsior uh, series of jumps. He actually had a suit where he lost the pressure on the glove. Now, the glove was actually a different compartment from the rest of the body, so that suit, you could actually lose a glove and only the hand was exposed to vacuum. In his case, his right hand was so swollen that it was basically about twice the size of his normal hand, and it swelled up in the glove, and then the glove itself was just holding the tissue together, and that's what allowed him to come back, but he had no use of his hand for the, the flight or the return down or the, the skydive down. In an earlier jump, actually in, in 1959, he actually got into a flat spin as well, like we were talking about earlier. He actually estimated about 120 um, RPM. So what we saw with Felix was 70 and that dummy was 170, so he was sort of in the middle. Probably pulled about 22 Gs, was completely unconscious. And then when he was low enough, an automatic uh, parachute deployment opened and uh, that saved his life. Um, and then the other one I wanted to talk to you about was this Soyuz 11. So I talked about it briefly, but this was a Soyuz um, capsule. <coughs> it was coming down from um, a successful orbit, and the equalization valve was, le was unfortunately, it basically opened when they released the separate components as it comes down to, to Earth. Uh, the crew, the capsule landed automatically. The crew was not coming out of the vehicle, so the rescue team went in there, and they found that they still had a pulse, again, kind of like Nick Piantanita, uh, but they were anoxic from, from the high altitude exposure. Um, so I don't want to leave you on a, you know, sort of a downer. I think that, <laughs> I think that um, we've learned from, you know, these past mistakes, and I think, as you see, you know, there, we're always trying to go the next step forward and make a new uh, safety system or a new way to, to prevent injuries. The problem is that these are never just 100% helpful and sometimes the way we prevent an injury can open a whole new failure way that can, that can cause you know, other problems in itself. So these are complex systems. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, it's definitely not like what you see in science fiction. 
And so I'm hoping that you'll see with you know, the upcoming launches from Boeing and SpaceX getting Americans back on ISS, you'll see successful flights where there's engineers, uh, space medicine doctors, and uh, crew all working together to make safe flights. And hopefully in four years, we'll have people walking on the South Pole, finding water in, the, in these craters that are, are permanently shadowed. And, uh, and hopefully we'll get a lunar base out of that and then make some of that science fiction reality. So, thank you. Last month I was in Huntsville and I met Robert Stewart, who was the first astronaut out of the shuttle in a jet pack. Mm -hmm. And about a year ago, I heard Harrison Schmidt, who was the last astronaut to walk on the moon here. And both of those guys said, it's too hard and too dangerous to go to Mars. And they're both about my age. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> so, it, so it's, it's really hard and it's really dangerous just to go even to the space station. We, we sometimes take it for granted. We had just last year, uh, Nick Haig, one of our NASA astronauts, was in an abort, actually an in-flight abort. So we saw that demonstration in a test with unmanned crew. He was in a Soyuz that, that punched out basically of an exploding rocket, pulled about 18 Gs, was relatively unharmed and was able to go back on the space station. So he had his flight soon after. So launch and landing are always dangerous and that you're getting it whether you're going you know, on a balloon to 120,000 feet to the space station, moon, or Mars. Um, so that risk is there and it's well controlled. The transit phase, which is, you know, the six months it would take us to go from the Earth to Mars and to come back, we've been learning more and more about that with the ISS, and that's why it's such a great lab, because it allows us to have people be there for a year, which, and people hear about this one year on space. Why one year? Because that's how long you'd be in space for when you're going to Mars. It'd be six months there and six months back. And so that's something that we've, we've developed really good protocols to be able to keep your muscle strength, keep your bone density, keep all of that working. The problem is when you're going from here to Mars, you have no magnetic shielding from the Earth. So the space station is uh, 400 kilometers. It's about 250 miles off the ground. So it's not really that far off. And so it's still underneath the radiation uh, belt that the Earth has. And so when you're going to the moon, um, or especially when you're going to Mars, you have no protection whatsoever from radiation. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the major concerns. And there's only so much shielding you can take, because shielding is mass. And the more mass you take, you know, that's less of something else you can take. One of the scary events that we hear about, and it's from, from Harrison uh, Smith's time, is between, I think it's between Apollo 14 and 15, or 15 and 16, there was actually a solar flare that was so massive that if Apollo astronauts had been walking in the spacesuit on the moon, <coughs> they probably have had a lethal radiation dose. And so that's something that is still something that we don't know really you know, how to shield, how to treat, and how to manage. Uh, my wife and I can remember the Vanguard missions. But anyway, uh, with uh, now it's not just uh, Russia and the U.S. There's probably a ha at least a half a dozen other nations that are doing space exploration or are interested. Uh, from a peaceful point of view, what kind of sharing is there? I mean, do you, the work you're doing, uh, do you have an inter interaction uh, with uh, Chinese or Indian or, or other uh, similar scientists? So uh, this is a great question. because So space medicine, the, the medical field tends to have this sort of, um, sort of like joker card or like trump card where they can um, allow a lot more cooperation. So that's what actually led, I mean, the space station, which is a program between you know, Russia and the US now, really grew out of the shuttle mirror program uh, which was in the, started in the early 90s, and that was really a collaboration between um, the U.S. and Russia, but really was started with even the Soviet Union. So many of you maybe remember Apollo Soyuz test program. And so um, the medical field is special in which there's no sort of like competitive advantage that you want to have over others. So when Boeing and SpaceX are competing for contracts, everything is very well segregated. This is not something that you want to share how you get you know, the best engine or the best propulsion or anything like that. Medicine is not that. And so in the medical field, 
there's a lot of interaction between the different uh, countries and the different aerospace uh, medical teams. And we have um, an annual meeting, the Airspace Medical Association, um, and that happens every year in the United States, and we see there are about a third of the 2,000 attendees are foreign, and there there's you know Germans, British, Australians, Japanese, Indian, uh, Russians, everybody gets to see that. And that's where, where it's a common forum where people can share that information. And so, for example, from the high altitude jumps, all of that medical side got published in the literature so that people can gain from it. So from the medical side, yes, there's a lot of collaboration. From the engineering mm -hmm. side, because a lot of this can be used for weapon systems, is much more restricted. Working with humans in extreme environments, has, have you learned many things that can help 2020 a human patients with their cardiovascular system or respiratory, cardiovascular COPD and things like that? Yeah, so absolutely. So if, one way to look at space exploration is basically um, a bed rest. So, and so you'll see that many of the, of the research that's done is actually on bed rest. So when you put somebody in a zero G when they're not active, um, they, they behave very similar to somebody who's paralyzed or is in a bed in an ICU um, and is not moving. And so you see a lot of the same atrophy of muscles, bone loss, and that causes a lot of calcium in the, in the blood flow, which then causes kidney stones and things like that. So a lot of these uh, pathologies tend to, to be similar. Um, so there's a lot of that that can be learned. Both is, learn, is used by the aerospace community to learn from, but also can be fed back. And so we can learn some new protocols on how to prevent bone loss or how to get, prevent muscle atrophy in people who have you know, limited mobility. When you come back and you're really wobbly because your vestibular system is completely not used to gravity anymore, the issues that you have, the neuromuscular issues and the motor control issues that you see are very similar to patients that have strokes or inner ear injuries. And so there's a lot of back and forth where um, we talk about it being translational medicine, where you go from the bench to the bedside and back to the bench. And so there's a lot of back and forth on that. And again, because there's no one specialty that runs space medicine, um, everybody tends to take you know, what they learn back to their home specialty. What kind of person does it take to volunteer for these programs? <laughs> and do y'all make sure they have good insurance? <laughs> so you'd be surprised how many people are willing to, uh, to do some crazy stuff. And you know, if, you, if you peruse YouTube for just a little bit, you'll see that, that people are doing crazy things. What, what's a little bit harder is to get large companies or, or governmental organizations to fund these projects because they don't want to be on the 9 8 o'clock news. Um, and so th th there's plenty of people lining up to do these sort of things. Um, as far as what it takes to do it safely, that's a lot harder. Okay, I think we have a question. Uh, I was curious about with the spinning, was there any use of attempted for thrusters? And also, did they use like a G suit, like a fighter pilot would use to keep the blood out of their lo lower extremities? Right, so a G suit requires external, you know, a gas supply that the airplane, the airframe usually provides. So, although there's a G suit is used on the space shuttle for the high altitude jumps, we couldn't carry that um, infrastructure. Um, we talked about different systems, either thrusters or even uh, uh, basically CMGs or, or reaction wheels where you can actually spin a mass so that you can counter it. Um, the problem is that all of that gets heavier and it shifts your weight, uh, your, your center of gravity, and it can sometimes make it worse. So the design that works best is actually a very high mounted drogue. So basically between the shoulder blades, have a small pilot chute, and that's our work best. We looked at wings between the legs to try to like do that flight, like wingsuits that you see you know, people you know, skydiving next to mountains and things where, you know, asking about the question, where do you find these people? <laughs> they're, they're out there. Um, so we looked at a, a variety of different systems and the drug is probably what works best. We were also using, uh, working on the premise that the person could be unconscious. And so we wanted to have a system that doesn't actually require human input. And so, so when you saw those testings, the automatic release, that was actually a G meter on the wrist 
and it would sense that you are over three and a half Gs for more than five seconds, it would automatically fire that, uh, that drogue shoot. We have a question all the way at the back. Right here. Oh, oh yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Testing, one, two, three, you hear me? <laughs> Loud and clear. Uh, <laughs> not a scientist. I play with fire ants, that's my specialty. But doesn't it seem more sensible to put a lot more instrumentation on the moon? Because we've been there to check things in outer space, many things, asteroids, anything else, than mess with Mars. You know, I'm honestly, I'm a personally, I'm a convert for, you know, moon first is what, you know, some people call it. Um, Mars has an atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere on Mars is about the same atmosphere that you were seeing on those high altitude jumps. It's about 1% of the Earth's atmosphere. So it's about 100,000 uh, feet. So the atmosphere actually doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't give any pressure where you can use, where you could actually just wear a gas mask or anything like that. Um, it does blow dust around and cover solar panels. So it does become a bit of a nuisance. The one advantage is that it's CO2, so you can use it to extract oxygen out of, but that's really about it. The moon is three days away, not six months away. You can get there whenever you want. You don't have to wait every two years to get the planets to line up right. Um, and if you put something on the, basically on the backside of the moon, it's not dark because it does actually go around so it gets sunlight. So that's, people call it the dark side of the moon, so the far side of the moon. Um, you could put you know, a radio um, telescope there that could be huge, like the ones we have here on, the, on Earth on the surface, as opposed to you know, Hubble, which has to fit in the back of a space shuttle. And you'd have absolute radio silence from Earth. So I think there's a huge potential for scientific research, not just you know, of the moon, but of the universe from the moon. So definitely. And I think it's also the best proving ground, so where you can learn how to work in pressurized environments, how to, we can extract oxygen from regular things like that, where we can do, it's called in situ resource utilization. So the idea is that you don't take everything you need to Mars or to the moon, you take just the tools to then make what you need over there. You're involved in this process and the government tends to run way behind. We got a three mile bridge, it's gonna take forever to be built. <laughs> <coughs> what do you think the chances are if they're actually meeting that 2024 deadline? Well, I was talking about earlier about this actually in the summer. I, this is my personal opinion again, and not based on any insider information or anything like that. I think it's like 50-50. And I think it's, it's a really aggressive schedule. The funding seems to be appropriately scaled to, to be able to support it, but space is hard. And that's something that we've seen Virgin Galactic saying they were gonna launch to space you know, next year for the last 10 years or so. It looks like it's probably gonna happen this year and, it, and it's looking good, but it's been next year for a decade. Um, SpaceX started in 2002, I believe, and they wanted to basically have you know, people in space much earlier. They were supposed, we're supposed to have Americans launching from Florida to the space station, I think five years ago even. Um, it was supposed to be a 2015 type launch 2014 2015 and we're still not there this might be the year so you know fingers crossed but it's something that takes hard and it's very easy to just you know get later and later and rushing it never works um, actually when we talk about challenger one of the causes of the root cause analysis for why challenger launched in that very cold january day was so that you could have the state of the union address to the with the crew in space and so there was a pressure to launch when it was much colder than it was um, and again, these are external factors where when you set arbitrary deadlines, it's, it's hard. For Mars, it's even harder because if you miss your window, you have to wait two years for the planets to line up again. But for the moon, if, it's, you know, if we do it in 2025 successfully, I'm more than happy than having a failure trying for 2024. Please join me in thanking Dr. Garvino.